Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 tonight. We're finishing up chapter 2 as we are continuing on verse by verse to the book of Ephesians. You know, we have all <clears throat> seen paid TV advertisements to where it is before and after, right? You know what I'm talking about. I mean, most of the time it's a crazy commercial to where they show you an over-exaggerated commercial to where it's just something normal that you normally do, but they go way out of their way and it makes it look so difficult to do just normal things, right? Uh, for example, whether it's, uh, whether it's you're, you're, you're cutting up an apple or you're unrolling toilet paper and they show somebody just smashing an apple or wrapping themselves like up with a mummy and they just make it look so difficult to do normal things. But if you buy their product, they show you how easy it is to do everyday normal jobs. And actually, let's just be honest, by the end of the infomercial, you're actually sitting there thinking, you know, maybe I do need scissors that can cut a penny. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, maybe you're sitting there thinking, you know, that, that might really actually help, help me around the house. I, I may need that. I may make things easier. But they always show you before and after, especially on weight loss commercials. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? They show somebody in the previous photos or videos, and then the next shot that they show you is someone standing in their old jeans that you could wrap around the sun, right? You're like, come on, there, there's no way. That, that's not the same person. There, there's no way. But we've all seen those before and after shots. And, and, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I've actually put a few up here. Uh, Tom, I'm going to tell you to go through, but go ahead and show the first one. This is a guy that before his hair transplant, go ahead and show the next one, Tom. There he is afterwards, okay? Now, the next one's pretty good, pretty good little deal. The next one is an actor. His name is Jonah Hill. Show, show the next one here. This is Jonah Hill here. The, the, some of you may know him. And this is before photo, and then show his after photo. He's done good. No, this is true. That's really him. I mean, he did a great job. He, he lost a lot of weight, and, and he, he, he did a great job, and so I'm proud of him for that. Um, this next one is Barbie before kids. <laughs> And go ahead, Tom, show Barbie after kids. That's about right. That's pretty good, right? And let's go ahead and close off with one more. Here's me before ministry. And here's me after ministry. What? I mean, what just happened? What just happened? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hey, I hope I look that good. I hope I look that good, Dad. That's all I'm saying. There you go. <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. I'm just kidding. I love him. I love that man right there. But normally, go ahead and go to the next slide. Now. That's right. But normally, you can tell a drastic difference in the before and after. And in our passage of Scripture tonight, friends, Paul is reminding us, listen, there should be a drastic difference in who we once were and who we are now. And that's what he lets us know. And in our scripture tonight, Paul is going to give us a great picture of our before and after. Try to honor and reverence the reading of the word. You're physically able. Please stand with me. As we start with verse 11. It says this. Paul says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time that you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, 
in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. God, I thank you for bringing us from who we were to who we are now through Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that we see the importance of living out the picture of after. Lord, uh, we need to remember who we were before. And now, Father, we need to live out knowing what you've done for us. And so, Father, I pray that you use your word tonight, speak to hearts. Father, just encourage the saints. And Lord, I pray that if there is someone here tonight that does not know you as Lord and Savior, Father, save souls. Do whatever you need to do. Father, this time is yours. Use your word. Father, may we rejoice in it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. May be seated. You know, we all have those before and after moments, but this before and after is a little bit different. This after brings about the greatest change ever. That's what it does. You see, this before and after, it is not social, it is not cultural, it is not racial, it is spiritual. It's spiritual. And, and through our last text that we looked at a few weeks ago in verses 1 through 10, when we studied that, we have seen how both Jews and Gentiles, both groups, were spiritually alienated from God. They were dead. We were dead in our sins and our trespasses, and we needed life, and we needed a Savior. That's what we looked at. But tonight, friends, now we see that transition from before to after. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's see what the word says right here. Let's dive in by first of all seeing who we were before our alien nation. Who we were before our alien nation. Listen to verse 11 through 12. This is what it says right here. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called in circumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, Having no hope and without God in the world. Now, Paul urges the church to do something in particular right here. One thing in particular, remember. He says, I want you to remember who you once were. Think back. Think back. And, and you know who they once were. The, the, they, they lived, when we do this, friends, they live with a greater sense of gratitude. And Paul wanted them to realize this. And friends, I think we do as well. When we remember back what God has done from us, for us and what he has brought us through, listen, friends, I have a greater love for God and I have a greater love for the members of, of the body. When we think about this, and if you think about it, friends, verse 11 and 12 actually follows from the patterns of verse 1 through 3. Go back and look at verse 1 through 3. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, and once you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You see, these verses right here, and even when we look at in verse 11 and 12, they, they really do paint for us a dark picture of what life apart from Christ involves, what it looks like, and we need to remember that. In short, friends, what Paul is telling us here is that we were all alienated from God and from the people of God. We were separated from them. And he says right here, remember who you once were. Um, growing up, I, I'm of that age to where I, I was in uh, middle school, but The Lion King came out. Any of you remember the original Lion King? Of course, they've redone it now. But there was a scene where, where Simba, he, he, is, he's, you know, he thinks he's guilty of his father's death. But if you remember, he runs away. He tries to escape the problem, right? He runs away, but then all of a sudden his hometown, his home area is, is taken over by Uncle Scar. And, and things have just gone downhill. And, and, and so they come after him, and all of a sudden uh, Rafiki, it was Rafiki, right? The monkey. And he comes after him and he says, your dad, I know who you are. You're Mufasa's boy. And he's like, no, no, I'm not. You know, type and he goes through it and then he says, you need to do something. You need to remember who you are. You need to remember who you are. And if you remember, then all of a sudden the cloud rolls in and then, then Mufasa is there and speaks to him and then he tells him as he's even after he talks to him while he's going away and he just keeps saying over and over, remember, remember. Well, right here, friends, listen, Paul's saying, remember who you once were. Friends, as I told you this a couple of weeks ago, I think it's good for all of us to take time and remember who we were before Christ. We need to remember what God has brought us from. 
But Paul goes on and talks about how through the work of Christ that we were saved. And, and listen, it wasn't about skin color. It was about heart. That's what it was all about. He goes on to note how the Jews looked on the Gentiles here as uncircumcised, okay? It wasn't about skin, it was about heart. You see, they dismissed the rest of the world as uncircumcised, not because the Jews were the only ones who practiced it, but because it was a physical sign of a covenant that had been made with the Lord. And so to be uncircumcised, hear me out in this church, to be uncircumcised actually was to be separated from the Lord. And so Paul then says that circumcision is, is something that was made in the flesh by hands in order to drive home the point that it belonged to the old order of Judaism with external features. It was a part of the old order. But then Paul goes on and he elaborates on the past and who we were in the past. First of all, notice this. I didn't put these in your notes, but if you want to write them down, I, I want you to notice right here that he says, first of all, we were Christless. We were Christless. Listen to what he says in the first part of verse 12. That at that time, you were without Christ. Friends, the Gentiles were ignorant to the things of the Messiah. The Jews, once again, that they were told about the Messiah in the Scriptures. They had the Old Testament text, right? They were looking forward to the Messiah. They knew what was coming. Gentiles didn't know. They didn't know about it. And friends, even today, if you are separated from Christ personally, then listen, you are excluded from the life of God. Matter of fact, flip over to chapter 4, listen to verse 18. It says this, Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Listen, friends, there are people that are without God. They don't realize that they're lost, and there's that ignorance in their life, but they're blinded. They're blinded. And they don't know it. Look at it again. He says right there, having their understanding dark in other words, they don't know. Being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And so I read that again. So I want you to understand. They don't even realize that they're lost. They don't know. And their eyes are darkened. And, and why? Because they're Christless. They're Christless. And that's what he said right there in the first part of verse 12. And friends, well, that's something we need to realize, that this world needs to have their eyes open. They need to understand that they are lost. They need to realize that. But second, he says, friends, that not only were we priceless, he also says that all of us at one point in time were foreigners. What? Oh, yeah, listen to the second part of verse 12. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. You see, right here... They were excluded from their citizenship of Israel, and therefore, friends, they were alienated from God's people because they were not part of their original Abrahamic covenant. And so that's how they felt. They were foreigners, right? That they didn't fit in. They were not a part of the group. And so with this being the case, and friends, this means that thirdly, they were hopeless and godless. They were hopeless and godless. Listen to the last part of verse 12. Listen to this. Having no hope and without God in the world. Church, without God, there is no hope. There is no hope. And that's what he says right there. You see, before Christ, that they didn't have the hope of the promise. Nor did they even know the God of the promises. <laughs> they, they didn't know who it was. They had opted for idols instead of God. And therefore, friends, they did not know the true God, nor did they know hope. Church, I want to remind you that before we trusted in Christ for salvation, we were in the same tragic position. In all three of these areas, we were Christless. We were foreigners from the kingdom of God. Not only that, friends, because we were foreigners of the kingdom of God, we were hopeless and we were godless. Oh, sure, we may have had those gods that we talked about this morning. We may have had our own gods, but as far as worshiping the true God, we didn't have it. We were all in this state, and we were all in the same tragic position. We were separated from God and his people. And so, friends, if we continue to remember where we came from, then I believe that we will live with a constant gratitude towards God, and we'll have love towards his people, because we'll remember that. And we won't take it for granted. But then Paul tells us, secondly, about what happened. He talks about our reconciliation. He talks about our reconciliation in verse 13 through 18. Listen to what he says. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself 
is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Friends, verse 13 actually begins with the great word that takes us back to verse 4. Look at verse 13 again. But. Do you remember what we talked about in verse 4? Do you remember when you go back? Remember we were dead in our sins and our trespasses? In verse 4 though it said what? But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. But, see, when there seemed to be no hope, there's a but. A dramatic change has occurred. Read verse 13 again. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Oh, church, what a great statement. What a great statement. By the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we can be brought near to God. Friends, only through his blood can we be reconciled to God. That's it. That's why we must preach the cross. That's why we must preach it. The cross is central. Listen, there are many people that don't like to talk about all that blood language stuff. They don't like to talk about that. Listen, they don't, they don't like to talk about that in the Bible. But listen, his blood reminds us of what God has done for us in his great love. And he shed the son, his, his son's precious blood on that cross. And you know what blood also does? Blood also reminds us of the gravity or seriousness of our sin. That our sin is so serious that it took the life of the Son of God on the cross. Sin is so serious that before Christ came that they would have to sacrifice an animal shedding precious, innocent blood. That animal didn't do anything. But precious, innocent blood had to be shed. He without sin became sin. Christ's precious, innocent blood was shed to pay for our sins. Friends, that shows, once again, the seriousness of our sin. But then Paul does something pretty interesting here. Paul then remarkably he shifts gears. And, and, and notice what he does right here. Now, from here on out, he, he goes from you to we and our. That, that's what he does. He talks about this in our section. You see, both Jew and Gentile now have the same hope because of the atoning death of Jesus Christ. We all now have that same hope. Now, I want you to think about three things that the Savior has done for us in his reconciling work. I want you to think about three things. Like I said, I want you to write these down and put them on your screen, but I want you to write them down. First of all, number one, he tells us right here in verse 14 that he has brought us peace. Look at verse 14. It says this, for he himself is our peace. He has brought us peace because he himself is our peace with God. Church, he is the peacemaker between man and God. Let that sink in. He is the, he's the one that brought us peace to God. Before, listen, friends, we were facing the wrath of God. Now we get to experience the peace of God. Does that make sense? He brought us peace. And we see this right here. That's what's in between man and God. So he brought us peace. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. And y'all, this is so good. According to the second part of verse 14 all the way down to verse 16, guess what, friends? He has made us one. Listen to what he says right here. Who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of the commandments, contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he, he might reconcile them both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Let's talk about this for a moment. Paul says right here, y'all, this is so good. I, I want you to understand what's happening right here. Paul says right here that he has broken down, that Christ has broken down the middle wall of separation. Let me explain what's happening right here. 
As Paul is writing this letter, friends, there was a literal wall standing in the temple that excluded the Gentiles. The Gentiles were not allowed to pass a certain point in the temple. Only the Jews could go past that wall. And so as Paul is writing this, he is seeing this right here. That was a physical wall. But he is saying right here that what Jesus did on that cross, what he did for sinners, he tore down that wall of separation. That it is for everyone. And so by Jesus abolishing the old, he is saying right here that, friends, what he actually did was he established something new. He created a new man. Listen, friends, I, here's what's so good. There is no diversity in the body of Christ. We are one. He established this new being. Listen, the cross of Jesus Christ brings unity. Unity. So he has brought us peace. He has made us one. But thirdly, friends, he tells us right here that he has given us access to God. Y'all listen to this, verse 17 and 18. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Paul said, notice what he says again, that through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Friends, can I tell you, that's what prayer is all about. You see, before it was Jews and Gentiles. The Jews were the ones that were near. The Gentiles were far off. But he says, you know what? Now it's equal playing ground, friends. It's equal ground. It's equal playing field. And that's what he's saying right here. And he's saying that, that through prayer now, we can have that conversation with God. All of us can go to the Father through the Son by the Spirit. We have that access. And church, listen, this is an ongoing benefit of what he has done for us. But at this very moment, they'll set it this morning at the end of our service. At this very moment, if we chose to, church, what is so great is the fact that we have access to God himself. That's what church says, hallelujah. That we have access to God himself anytime we want to. So praise God for our reconciliation. But now thirdly, Paul tells us who we are now. Our identification. Who we are now, our identification. Listen to verse 19 through 21. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You see, Paul actually summarizes Christ's reconciling work by reminding the Gentiles of who they were, and who we are now. We are now a part of the greatest community ever. That's what he's letting us know. We are part of the greatest community ever. And actually Paul uses three word pictures right here to describe who we are in this community. He says that we are citizens, we are family, and we are stones. What? I'm going to say that again. That we are citizens, we are family, and that we are stones. You see, verse 19 actually tells us that we are now citizens in God's kingdom. Listen to what it says again. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Church, you know what Paul is saying right here? Listen, that we are no longer second-class citizens. No, 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 no. What he's saying right here, friends, is that we, we belong somewhere. We belong right here. Well, we're not second-class citizens in someone else's country. Now, here's what is also interesting. I remind you, friends, that Paul is writing during a time in which Roman citizenship was prized. If you had citizenship of Rome, it was a big deal. It was huge. And they had privileges being a citizen of Rome. And listen, friends, citizenship in a great country like the USA, it is a great blessing. We are blessed living where we are. I know things may look bleak right now, but we're blessed. And I still believe this is the greatest country. And we believe that. But there is nothing like being a citizen of the kingdom of God. Even though we're blessed living where we are, 
We're even more blessed being a part of the citizenship of the kingdom of God. Paul says right here, like I said, that we belong. We belong. We are a part of a kingdom that has no end. Hey, let me tell you something, church. We don't ever have to worry about a financial collapse in our kingdom. We don't ever have to worry about that. But, but he also says something else. He says we're also part of God's family. We're a part of the family. Look at the second part of verse 19. But fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You see, actually, Paul's metaphor changes from community to family. Now, how are we one family? Simple answer. We have the same father. That's what it all boils down to. Paul just said back in verse 18 that we have access by one spirit to the father. We have the same father. And, and, and you know, friends, if you've heard your entire life, I want to remind you the church is not just a building that we go to or an event that we attend. No, no, no. It is a family living together on mission for the Father. That's what the church is. And Paul also reminds us, though, that I said, well, we're not only citizens, not only family, but we're also stones of his temple. What? Oh, yeah. Keep going. Listen to verse 20 and 21. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Oh, church, let's talk about this for a moment. Now, you know that this had to get their attention. Why, Brother Callum? Because the temple there in Israel was the focal point. The temple was the house of God. They held treasure right there in that temple for nearly a thousand years. But now Paul's coming along and saying, there's a new temple. And this temple is made up of the people of God with Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Friends, there is only one cornerstone, and he makes the whole building possible. That's what we need to remember. Our community is built upon him. He is the one that gives security to the temple. He is the one that gives the alignment to the temple. Listen, friends, there is no true temple without Christ as the cornerstone. He is the true temple. But we are carefully shaping building blocks, and we are the building blocks that is going to fit into this temple. Which tells me this, friends, that we need all the blocks we can get, and we need you to fit into your place. Think about that. We need all the blocks we can get, and we need you to fit in your place. But I want you to notice something. I don't want us to skip over something. Notice the last three words in verse 21. In the Lord. In the Lord. You see, friends, it's in the Lord that we are a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And in order to be a part of this true temple, friends, you must be in the Lord. Why? Because we ourselves are the temple of God. Does that make sense? And so that's what he's saying right here. We have to be in the Lord. But being in the Lord, friends, listen, is who we are. It's a circle. It's who we are. It only makes sense. And so knowing who we are, friends, finally tonight I want us to see what are we to do? Our application. What are we to do? We see our application. Listen to verse 22. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. According to this, friends, what Paul is actually saying is that Christ wants us to help build a people. He is not wanting us to merely be isolated individuals who believe in him. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this. I believe that this passage right here confronts individualism. What do you mean by that, Brother Colin? Well, let me explain. What I mean by that is that some say that you know, they don't want to be a part of the church, but yet they claim Christ. You know what I'm talking about. They want to be a part of the church, but they claim Christ. Well, let's just put everything together that we've looked at so far. Let's talk about these things and see if it makes sense, okay? To be separate from the church, but yet still claim Christ. Think about this. Is to say, hey, I want to be a stone, but I want to be away from the building. Think about that. It doesn't make sense, does it? Hey, let's keep going. Just say, hey, hey, you know what? I, I, I want to be a part of, I, I, I don't, you know, I claim Christ, but I don't want to be a part of the church. Is to say, hey, I want to be a son or a daughter, but not part of the family. 
Well, then why do you want to be a son or a daughter? Not only that, you may say, well, hey, I want to be a citizen, but I don't want to live in that country. Then why do you want to be a citizen? You see, Paul uses those three metaphors for a purpose. In other words, you need to do your part to plug in. That's what it is. You plug in. That's what he's saying. Does any of this make sense? I, I mean, all these things, if you're going to say, hey, you know what? I, I want to be a brick, but I'm not being a part of that building. That doesn't make sense. Why well, then would you want to be a part of the stone you just left out? Why would you say, hey, yeah, I want to be a part of that family? Nah. No. Why don't you say, hey, I want citizenship in that country, but I'm never going to go to that country. It doesn't make sense, friends. That, that's what he's saying right here. Folks, the New Testament assumes that every Christian should be a part of a local church. It assumes it here. It's, it knows nothing of a Lone Ranger Christianity. No, no, no. You see, we show that we are a part of the universal church by partnering with the local bride. You see, we live out our spiritual union with other believers visibly. Well, you know what I'm, I don't get along with them down there. I don't want to be a part of them down there. But friends, I, I want to remind you. Not every brick comes out perfect. But you make it work. You do what you got to do. Listen, you want to tell me that every member of your family is perfect? Mine's not. But I love my family. You want to tell me that you agree with every citizen in the United States of America? Lord, we know that's not true. But I love my country. What I'm trying to say is this. We need to do our part. We don't sit out. We do our part. Hey, I heard someone once say this. Stop being a ninja Christian. This could be a t-shirt. Just slipping in and out of worship without a trace. There are far too many. That they come in, they sit down, and they leave. And they don't talk to anybody. They just want to come in, put in their time, leave. They don't want to do anything. They want to come in, put in their time, leave. Friends, I want to remind you tonight. Listen, you have a purpose. We're to be a part of a family. And that's how God actually intends for us to live out our faith and love one another in community with one another. To serve purpose with one another. And hey, listen, I'll be the first to admit that working with others at times is hard work. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Maybe you're here tonight, and, you, and you're sitting here, and you realize, you know what? I, I thank the Lord that Paul is reminding us where we've been, he's showing us where we are now, and he, he's actually showing what we are to do. But maybe you're sitting here tonight, and you realize that you're not applying. Then why not start tonight? Be that stone that you need to be. Be that family member that you need to be. Be that citizen. That you need to be in the kingdom of God. And serve him faithfully. Maybe tonight you want to come up to this altar and make that commitment. Just like you did this morning. You said, I will. Maybe tonight you're saying, it's time. Because I realize where I've been. Where God has brought me from and where I am now. It's time for me to be serving him. If that's you, maybe you want to come up and say, Lord, give me direction in that way. Come on. But I'll tell you what. You'll never serve him fully. Until you know him. Maybe you're here tonight and you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you want to be a part of what Paul's talking about out here. If that's you, then Prince Paul, I'd love to introduce you to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords tonight. I encourage you to come. But if you have a decision you need to make, I pray that you make it. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the Apostle Paul showing us the before and after. <laughs> thank you for showing us what who we were and who we are now. Lord, I thank you for, for the visualization that you've given in your word tonight. Father, I thank you for 
the Holy Spirit speaking to Paul and having him write this down so that we could have it several generations later. And so, Father, I pray right now for this invitation time. Father, I pray for those that may just need to come up here and say thank you for realizing what you've done in their life. Father, I pray for those that may just need to come up and say, God, I need to be used by you. Father, I pray for those that maybe on a Sunday night, someone here tonight is saying, you know what, I need to be a part of this local family here. Whatever it may be, God, I, I pray that you draw people's hearts. And Father, I pray that people are obedient. But God, may your word, may your word go forth. May people hear it, and may people give you praise for it. And may your kingdom be expanded. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please.